On page 67 in your workbooks, we're going to take a look at how we actually communicate the gospel to people. Uh, what we would like to do is suggest that if we have a plan for how we go about doing that and we feel comfortable with it, it'll be more, much more easy to actually uh, get into that kind of conversation where we begin to explain the gospel message to people. We want to show you, as our case, uh, a video of uh, a doctor that, uh, we, uh, that we videotaped in the past, Scott Stringfield. And he has a really interesting way of both communicating the gospel and sharing his testimony kind of all wrapped up in one. So take a look at this, and we'll take some time to evaluate it when we, when we get out, when we finish this. So, Scott, you just draw right on the table paper, huh? Yeah, uh, it was kind of, it came about uh, by happenstance of uh, talking with a patient is sometimes um, we as physicians are uncomfortable as we get into more intimate discussions about spiritual things. And one of the things I found is that I use the table as, if you will, somewhat of a barrier between me and the patient, but I use the table paper as the easel, if you will, mm -hmm. to, do, to draw it out. And mm -hmm. so in the particular instance I was talking about is I would just give a simple bridge illustration. And, and usually what I would do is I would, I'd been taught to give a testimony and then the gospel, but I found that it was more effective to give the testimony as I was giving the gospel. And so I draw a chasm, typical with a bridge illustration, and I would say, this is, uh, this is me, and this is where I was in life. And and I was, uh, uh, these, the things I was experiencing before I knew God were, and then I'd write things out like frustration and uh, no peace and so forth. And I would list several things that I had struggled with, uh, mm. lack of direction, uh -huh. purposelessness. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then... Things uh, your patients would be Exactly. Things that they were experiencing that I was trying right. to relate and connect with yeah. them. Yeah. And, but I wanted to draw it in first person for me because I, I didn't want them to say I was, this is them. I want to say right. this is That's me. Great. And then I would say, you know, what I was looking for was what was over here. And I'd draw a picture of this is God. And what God was offering was peace and fulfillment and security and uh, direction, many of the things that most people are looking for but have a hard time finding. Mm -hmm. And I say that what really comes down to is that, r simply put, God said that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and I'll typically write that out down here, Romans 3.23. And I'll write it out as we go and talk about what that means. And then, and that really is the chasm between us and God. And then what I did was I'd begin to show, well, there are people, though, who believe they can get to God on their own, and they do that through good works, or they do that through philanthropy, or they do that through religion and ritual and sacrifice, whatever they are. But these all fall short, according to the Bible, of being able to reach God, because we can't get to God on our own. But instead, He reached instead down to us. And, and the way He did that was by sending His Son, Jesus, on the cross. And I draw a cross out typically in this drawing, and then draw the word Jesus here. And then uh, quote the verse uh, uh, John 1 12 which says but as many as received him to those he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name and so I guess in a sense this is my simple presentation of the gospel that they're here and this may be what they're experiencing these are the things that God offers this is the problem that we have this is the offer that God gives us and it's up to us to choose to ask God to come into our lives and so having shared that then this is my, if you will, my um, home education. Then I can then take it and tear it off and then give it to the patient to go home on. Because I try to end the story by saying, if you choose to accept Christ, Satan's going to try to come in and give you doubt that you didn't do that. Uh -huh. And you're going to be faced with doubt. But one of the things I found, the second story that goes with this is that just like a mountain climber who climbs up the mountain, as they climb, they, they hammer these little pitons into the mountain. And those are uh, something they string their rope through so that if they start falling, those pitons will eventually catch them and keep them from falling to their depth. And the day that they accept Christ is like that piton. They hammered in the mountain. And so when they start falling and Satan challenges, well, you didn't really accept the Lord. Look at your life now, mm -hmm. that they have that. And so it's important for me to, if you will, to date this and to give them that concept that this is something that they've done if they choose to. That's great. And you actually put the date on there? I put the date on that and usually we'll, somehow in there I'll try to personalize it with their name or something like that. So Scott, how long do you usually take when you share the gospel like this with a patient? Um, I would say it probably takes less than five minutes. Um, I guess it takes as long as it takes. Yeah. I guess it depends yeah. on how important it is. Uh, but I, Well, you can take as long as sure. you, you need, but you sure. can communicate this in I believe in you can communicate minutes. it very quickly if you're comfortable with the verses, right. you're comfortable with the concept.
Um, so, all right, what is the right approach to use when we're actually beginning to communicate the gospel with people? And I want to bring out uh, three different things, three questions that we really ought to ask. First of all, does it answer the right core questions? Because every gospel presentation offers Jesus as an answer to a personal felt need or aspiration in a person. And I, I think we said this at some point or another in our, because nobody comes to Christ unless they have some kind of felt need for Christ, all right? Now, they may not have connected those dots, and that's our job, but they have, they have a need. There's, there's an, they're not satisfied with the life that they're living, and we need to be able to explain the gospel in terms that, that, that how the gospel actually meets that particular need. Um, uh, Tim Keller is a couple of things that he said, and let me just jump into the margin here. Unless... He says that unless they find, and this is a non-Christian, unless a non-Christian finds the presentation of Christ surprisingly attractive and compelling and stereotype-breaking, their eyes will simply glaze over when uh, we try to talk to them about the gospel. I think that's really true. And so we always need to be thinking, what's, not what's in it for me, not what do I want to communicate, but what's in it for the other person? How am I showing that Christ is this incredible answer uh, and is surprisingly attractive and compelling uh, in answering that. <clears throat> Second question is, does it take into consideration the cultural beliefs, does it take into consideration the cultural assumptions belief that make Christianity seem implausible? Our culture, and I would say especially in, in New York, uh, our culture is bombarding people with messages that Christianity can't be true. Um, and uh, so we need to really kind of understand that. And our job is not necessarily to argue with people or refute them, but what we can do is begin to help them have some doubts about their, what they're so uncertain, or excuse me, what they're so certain about, about why Christianity can't be true. Here's some, there's some objectives uh, or some <clears throat> beliefs that, uh, that our culture has that are in your notebook on page 67. Here, there can't be just one re true religion. Uh, a good God would not be would not allow evil and suffering. Christianity is a straight jacket. Some of you may have heard these things, and uh, it's it's important if we have the opportunity uh, to begin to make ask people to really think about the truth of these statements in some way. And so these these statements about possible responses uh, to these questions or to these statements that I've given you here. Uh, came out of uh, The Reason for God by Tim Keller, as well as uh, uh, Center Church, I think, is the other book that where he talks about uh, bringing the gospel into certain cultures and, uh, and addressing that so clearly. So what is it that makes the gospel attractive to people? Uh, one of the most important things is that people need to be shown what the gospel is all about. And we've spent a lot of time talking about that. It's not just telling people that Jesus loves them, but it's showing them that Jesus loves them in some way through our own life and uh, the way we love people and treat people. So does it answer the right core question? Does it take into consideration the cultural assumptions that are in the way of a person asking, uh, actually beginning to think about and, and consider the possibility of trusting Jesus? And then lastly, am I comfortable with it? Uh, do I really have a degree of understanding uh, of how I'm going to communicate the gospel uh, that I feel real comfortable with? Because if I'm not comfortable with it, I'm probably not going to do that. And so that's one of the things that we're going to try to help, help give you some ways to do that. Um, <clears throat> there is not one way to communicate the gospel. All right? Let's be real clear here. Uh, there is a gospel message that's unchangeable, but the way we the way we communicate it is, you know, is, uh, is, is there's, there's really no, no one way. Uh, a critic told evangelist Dwight Moody, says, I don't like your evangelistic methods. And Moody said, well, I don't much like them either. What do you have to suggest? And he, what is your method? And, and the guy said, uh, I don't have a method. And Moody said, I like mine better. <laughs> and so we want you to begin to think about how you can actually share the message of Jesus Christ with people. Walt's going to
come up and, and, and talk about one, one way to do this that he's found very effective in communicating the gospel message. Walter? Thank you, Bill. So just a reminder, so many missiologies talk about sharing the gospel as part of the harvesting process to persuade someone to pray a prayer, if you would. But we like to think of a gospel conversation as occurring in the planting process. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the harvesting process. Certainly, it can be important in that process, but there may be opportunities that you will have from time to time, as I do a few times a year, when someone expresses an interest. And it's a, appropriate to have a, a planting or a sowing conversation about what the <clears throat> gospel is. Had a patient uh, not too long ago, who, a young man who I'm following for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. He's chosen to use warfarin as his anticoagulant. He can't afford any of the more expensive uh, agents. And so I see him once a month for, <clears throat> for his follow-up. In his spiritual history, he had indicated that he had no interest uh, in any sort of uh, personal relationship with God, but he had grown up in a church situation but was not involved at all in that he was open to me praying with him, but other than that, no, no spiritual interventions. I happened to walk into the office not too long, long ago to see him, and he had uh, somebody, I don't know if it was a staff person, someone left a Bible, and he had the Bible open. And I walked in and he shut it real quick and pushed it away. I said, James, I had no idea you were interested in the Bible. He said, well, <clears throat> I try to read it once in a while, and I just can't understand the dadgum thing. And I sat down with him, and it reminded me of a, of a story. I remember as a, as a teenager trying to read the Bible from front to back at least twice, and it made no sense. And I told James, I said, you know, I tried the same thing when I was a kid, and I tried reading it front to back, and it made absolutely no sense at all. He said, I know what you mean. And I said, hey, if I could tell you everything the Bible says in one sentence, would you be interested? He said, that will save me a lot of time. <laughs> And so I pull out a pre-printed piece of paper that we kept in our, in our drawers that has Romans 6.23 written across the top. But you could write this on a piece of paper on the exam table or whatever. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And use a bridge illustration similar to what Scott Stringfellow uses, showing two sides of a, of a chasm, if you would. And I simply underline or circle the word wages and then write it below. And it's an opportunity to discuss wages. What are wages? They're what you are paid. They're what you have earned. They are what you deserve. James, what would it mean to you if you had earned something and weren't paid it? And what would be unfair? It would be unjust. It wouldn't be right. What if you weren't paid enough for what you did? He says, that's my life story. <laughs> you, know? you understand wages. Well, the Bible talks about wages for what the Bible calls sin, which means wrongdoing or missing the mark. I said, James, have you ever made any decision you wish you could take back? He said, lots of them. We all have. In fact, the Bible says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. We've not uh, uh, done everything right. We've all made mistakes. And the Bible says there's a wage for that. There's a payment for that. There's something that we've earned, that we've deserved for that. And that'll either underline or circle the word death. The Bible says that there's a payment due for wrongdoing. And it's not just physical death and disease that enter the world, but it's death of a personal relationship with God, that we do not know him personally as much as he might love us, but we don't, we're, we're missing that relationship. And that's the bad news that the Bible talks about. But the Bible has a but. And the but is that there's some good news. There is a gift available. A gift, <clears throat> James, is what? Something you earn? No. It's something you're given. It's freely given. It's not earned. It's not purchased. 
But when does that gift become yours? So Kathleen, if I want to give you this clicker, is it yours? Is it yours? Is it yours? Is it yours? Not yet. <laughs> but when does it become yours? When you take it, when you receive it, when you accept it. So the Bible tells us that there's a gift from God, from your creator, your father in heaven. James said, I used to believe in him. I used to believe in him, but I don't anymore. We had a chance to unpack that for just a minute. But this God, this creator who created you and loves you have a, has a gift for you. And then underline or circle eternal life and bring it down. And James, eternal life isn't pie in the sky when you die by and by. Jesus said in the high priestly prayer of John 17, John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they might know you and your son, Jesus Christ. Eternal life is a personal relationship with God that begins now, that allows you to know him and allows him to begin changing you to look more like himself. So there's bad news and there's good news. And the bridge, the crossover, the connection between the bad news and the good news is Christ Jesus. God sent in the flesh to live a perfect life as a model for us who died on the cross, a horrible, tortured, excruciating death on our behalf that we might begin a relationship with him and that he might become our personal Lord. And I'll write your Lord there. And I say that the way that that begins is when you make a decision to cross over from the bad news to the good news. When you make a decision to have him become your personal Lord and Savior. When you choose to bring him into your life and begin a relationship with him. He said, do I have to cross over? And I said, what do you mean do you have to? He says, no, to come to, to see you here. Do I have to cross over? I said, no, no, no. I said, you couldn't even if you wanted to. And he said, why not? And I said, because Jesus said, no person can cross over. No person can come to the Father until the Father calls. And so I just want you to understand the process. But when he begins the process of knocking on your heart, when he begins the process of calling you, of drawing you, into, you'll know, you'll know. And when that happens, I'd love for you to share that I'd love for you to share that with me. I'll often, as I do with him, say, well, you haven't crossed over yet, but where are you? And give them a little chance to put where they are. In other words, from all the way on the left to all the way on the right, where are you? And he drew himself all the way over to the left. And I said, James, I don't think so. I actually think you're closer. I really do. I just, I don't know why, I just think you're closer. But when you're ready to cross over, you let me know. Now, the interesting thing about this is, I, I don't know date on this, just my anecdotal experiences. This is very similar to the visual analog scale that we use in chronic pain, where people can rate their chronic pain on a zero to 10 scale. Or in uh, mental health, Elaine, where we use the little visual scale from, for depression, where people will rate themselves from zero to 10. And the data shows they're pretty darn good at, at putting themselves where they are actually on, on the scale. And so... Uh, the idea of them crossing over. Now, in James' case, he wanted an explanation of what the Bible said in one verse. But whatever need it is that the patient is wrestling with is the result of the wages of sin, part of the death of a relationship with God, a personal relationship with God, are the things that our non-Christian patients are wrestling with. And so whatever need they have can be connected to whatever fruit they're looking for, the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So when I was done, I said, uh, he said, uh, will you sign that? No, no, he said, can I have that artwork? <laughs> and I said, well, sure, here, take it. And he said, will you sign it? So I signed it, and I put the date on it. 
And then uh, we and said, well, let's get on. We've got, I've got other patients I need to move on, but take this and think about it, and we'll talk about it next time. The next month when he came in, I walked in the room, and he jumped up. Now, this guy's a real quiet, introverted guy, but he jumps up with a big smile on his face, and he runs across the room to hug me. And he's a, a smaller man, so he's hugging me. And I'm like, what's going on? He goes, I crossed over, I crossed over, I crossed over. <laughs> and you know what I thought? I thought, is he cross-dressing, or is he... <laughs> Got gender identity. I mean, I just forgot. Our, and then I realized our discussion. I said, you crossed over. He said, yeah. He said, I did. I, I'm going to a little church down from the halfway house. And I, I'm going, and the, the preacher's explaining the Bible, and I'm understanding it. And he said, uh, and the preacher wants me to come forward and make a public profession of my faith, and I haven't done it yet. And I said, well, if you're scared to, I'll, I'll come, and I'll go with you. He says, no, no, not scared of walking down, but they want to dunk me, <laughs> and I'm scared about dunking. And I said, oh, James, I bet if you talk to them, uh, they'll let you make that profession without dunking for a while. <laughs> and the next interaction I had was, uh, I don't know, it was a month or two later that um, one of the nurses came and said, there's a woman in the waiting room that would like to talk to you. And she came back into the nurse's area, and she said, I am so-and-so, I'm the sister of James, she said. He's been our long-lost sheep for our family for many, many, many years, and we prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for him. And we don't know if you've heard, but he died. And I said, I, I don't think I heard that. And she said, yeah, he was hiking with a group of men from the church, and they were hiking in Cheyenne Canyon, and he apparently slipped, and he fell uh, 70 or 80 feet to his death. She said, but our family knows we'll see him in heaven because he came here. Now, my belief is they would have seen him in heaven if he hadn't come there, that God would have called him. But to have that privilege, and were we busy? Yes. Was I behind? Yes. But was the moment ripe? Yes. Yes. So when it comes to this type of presentation. What is it that you like? What is it that you don't like? What is it that's difficult for you there? Any comments? Sort of similar to what Scott did. Okay. Well, I want to give you a chance to practice. And what we're going to do is have you break up in groups of two. And we're going to ask you to use the little uh, uh, bridge diagram on page 69 and we're going to give you uh, two minutes to begin to begin sharing. It is shorter, and 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 my basis for that is a a passage from Daily Bread. You can see it on page sixty-eight of your of your handout. A senior chaplain in the Pacific Command in World War II disciplined, not discipled, disciplined the young chaplains who served under him. One of the severe tests which he used was to pull out his watch out of his pocket and say, imagine you have a dying man here. You have two, he has two minutes of consciousness before he passes out. Let me hear what you would say to him in two minutes. The discipline was for the good of the young chaplain and the wounded men he saved, he served. Life on the battlefield was not for pastors who failed to have an answer for eternal life. So we'll give you two minutes to begin explaining to your partner this bridge illustration. Ready? Go. Stop, 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 stop. 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 Your patient just died. So, but, but good news, good news, good news, patience, patience, you have resurrected. Now it, you pick up the story and you've got two minutes to finish it. Go. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Okay, now. Now, in love, in love, with respect and sensitivity and permission, give each other some feedback. 
as you were the patient, as you listened, what did you feel? What did you think? So if you'd share with each other for just a couple minutes and give each other your feedback. Go. Well, now, uh, now we have a, a special treat. Now we have a special treat for you. Um, Bill and I are always looking for, for examples of people who've begun to flesh out these principles and seeing the fruit of them. And we found an example with a world-class medical evangelist. A man who's known to share his faith with hundreds, if not thousands of patients, has seen them converted in churches formed from them. And you may actually know this man. Do you happen to recognize Randy Owens? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But Randy has a very powerful testimony of how even here in New York City, even a powerful subspecialist who sees patients not for long periods of time can be used of God even in a year of his greatest weakness. And I'd like you to listen to this heartfelt, transparent, vulnerable man explain how God used him in a patient's life and what I want you to listen for is, does he use a spiritual history? Does he pray with or for a patient? Are faith flags, faith stories, uh, uh, personal testimony, faith prescriptions, are they part of this interaction or not? What about spiritual referrals? What about sharing the gospel? Can this work in New York? Can this work for me? Well, let's see if Randy's got something to share with us about that. <laughs> Let me introduce you to my friend Randy Owen. Randy's a head and neck surgeon at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, originally from the state of Washington, where he earned a BA in science and humanities at Seattle Pacific University. Went to medical school at Columbia and then on to the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where he did not only his general surgery residency, but a fellowship in head and neck oncology. He's been practicing there for a number of years. He's been the past president, in fact, our first president of the New York City CMDA chapter and is currently the area representative to the CMDA National House of Representatives. He's been on many medical mission trips, Gabon, Romania, Kenya, Pakistan, the Philippines, and most recently on a housing effort down in Haiti. I wanted Randy to join us and tell us a story about sharing his faith and his practice with a patient you think would probably not be interested. Randy, I, I uh, heard you had the opportunity to testify to a Jewish atheist, and God did something special. Tell us about it. Yes, indeed. I met a patient named Iris, uh, who gave permission to use her name and her story, about two and a half years ago, she and her daughter walked into my office, uh, referred to me by an oral surgeon who I'm a close colleague with, and uh, she presented with uh, massive tumors of the palate, of the tongue, and bilateral neck metastases. Oh. I was uh, shocked at the extent of her disease, and before I was even uh, able to do a biopsy, I could tell her that she had advanced cancer. We went ahead and did the biopsy and proved that she had uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the palate and of the tongue, two separate tumors with bilateral neck metastases. And I told her right there, her and her daughter, you need a huge operation, major reconstruction, followed by radiation, chemotherapy, you'll need a tracheostomy, you'll need a feeding tube for a chance of controlling this disease. She said, where do I sign? Wow. I then, as I always do with any patient that I tell has cancer, uh, I said, do you pray? 
And she gave me a unique answer to that question. She said, not anymore. Hmm. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, I lost my husband to cancer three years ago. And I gave up on God at that point. And I haven't prayed since. And I said, well, I'm so sorry to hear that. And I didn't have time to go into that story. But I said, I don't know everything that happened there. But I do want you to know that I believe in God, and I pray for all of my patients, particularly before I do surgery, particularly that have challenging cancers, and I will pray for you. And uh, she said, okay. And, and I said, do you mind if I pray for you right now? And she said, that would be fine. So the three of us prayed together, and I saw just a tiny window of hope there. That, mm. uh, that maybe there might be an opportunity to revisit this in the future. So what happened next? Uh, how did the surgery go? Subsequently, uh, we uh, operated on uh, Iris and did a near-total palatectomy, near-total glossectomy, bilateral neck dissections, tracheostomy, gastrostomy. And our uh, reconstructive surgery colleagues did an anterolateral thigh free flap, uh, which went very nicely, and uh, she she did relatively well postoperatively until about a week after surgery, and she was tachycardic and hypoxic and was found to have a pulmonary embolism. Oh my. So we treated her with anticoagulation. We actually put a, a filter in as well, and eventually uh, she got through her hospital stay. Uh, she went to rehab, and eventually she followed up with me. She made it through her course. She then started on a seven-week course of chemotherapy and radiation, uh, which was very difficult. She lost a lot of weight, but with the feeding tube, she was able to maintain her nutrition. Uh, And she finally made it through. And by the end, uh, she was very weak and debilitated, but uh, she was disease-free. So then after that, she gradually started to regain strength and would insist on coming to see me every month. Hmm. Most patients I see maybe every three months after an operation like that, and, and, but she said, no, I'm seeing you every month. <laughs> and <laughs> so I couldn't argue with her. Yeah. And what, what happened then spiritually? I mean, where's the story go from there? There were some openings. I, I would pray with her now and again, but not a lot of interest. She was very thankful for uh, the surgery and the treatment that she had had. She had a lot of trust in me, but didn't really express any interest in faith at that time. About a year after her surgery, you know, she'd see me every month, and so I I was trying to think of things to do for her, and and so I got a chest X-ray, and we found a one-centimeter lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And I told her about it and sent her to a thoracic surgeon, a friend of mine, and he did a lobectomy, and it was cured. And in some ways, it was cured because she insisted on coming in every month and getting such close follow-up. Again, our relationship developed, and, and then about a year after that, uh, she came in one day to see me, and she had an ulcer in her cheek right next to the flap. And I was concerned that this was a recurrence of cancer. And I told her that, and I biopsied it. And she just was immediately panicked and uh, distraught. And by this time, you know, she's got my email address and my (laughs) my phone number. And so she's texting me and emailing me constantly over the several next days while we're waiting for the pathology result. And so I engaged with her and I explained to her, you know, this is in God's hands. God has known what this is, how it came about from the beginning, and we have to trust him for the result. He is really the one that enabled me to help you with the surgery in the first place. She didn't quite buy it, but she understood what I, under, what I was trying to say. And over the weekend, I told her I was praying for her. The next week, she came in to see me, and the biopsy wasn't quite back yet, but she wanted to know, well, what if it is cancer, and what, what are we going to do? And... And I tried to steer her in the direction of trusting God, and I actually bought for her a copy of The Message, as well as the book by Tim Keller, The Reason for God. Mm -hmm. And I gave both of these to her, 
And then a couple hours later, the biopsy came back, and it was negative. It was not cancer. And in fact, what had happened was there was a tooth, a single molar, that had pushed its way into the cheek next to the flap, and it was irritating it. And so that was the cause. So you got that taken care of, and what happened? So I referred her to um, Ryan Lee, who's a Christian dentist who has a fellowship in oncology, and he shaved the tooth down and the ulcer went away. But by now, she had keyed in to the spiritual component. She read The Reason for God in two days. Oh, my goodness. And she emailed me back and she said, now I see that there was a reason for my suffering. It was amazing. And <laughs> then she started to read the Bible. She said, where do I start? I said, well, you know, I didn't want to offend her. She's Jewish. I said, read the Psalms. So she starts reading the Psalms. And a couple days later, I get a message from her. Who is this David? <laughs> she wasn't very Jewish, right? <laughs> I said, wow, you don't even know who David is. So I said, all right, read First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel. So she read it, and she said, this is amazing, you know. Then she wanted to know, what do I read next? I said, read Job. She reads Job, and she said, this is me, I'm Job. <laughs> and then she reads Judges and Esther and Genesis and Exodus, and, and then pretty soon she, she's run out of Old Testament books. <laughs> so I said, okay, read Matthew. So she read Matthew, and I get a message back from her, this Jesus is amazing. So what did you do next? I mean, her interest is growing tremendously in her hunger and God's spirit starting to work in her heart. Yeah, truly. You know, she would ask me questions about the scripture and I would try to interpret them for her. And, and I started to encourage her, maybe you should, uh, you know, consider going to a Bible study. She said, well, what's, what's a Bible study and how much does it cost? <laughs> And, you know, do you have to be a member and so on? Said, no, no, you just go and you study the Bible and get to know the other people and talk over the Scripture and share what's going on in your life. So so eventually she, she became interested. She got into a Bible study that I referred her to, and she loved it. And she, she really interacted well with all the people there. She read Matthew. She read John. She read Romans. She read Philippians, all of these great books. She, I, I told her to read Romans 5 where suffering leads to perseverance, leads to character, leads to hope. And she said, yes, this is exactly right. And so then a couple of months later, after she'd read just about the whole Bible, she emailed me and she said, I want to be a Christian. Wow. Did she come into your office or what happened next? I was amazed. And concurrently, throughout this whole year, I personally have had a very difficult year. My father passed away in April, who was really my best friend and, and mentor in Christ. I've had a lot of problems and issues in my family, and um, so that's been very difficult. And, and you know, I sort of thought to myself, well, I, I'm not really in a state right now to lead anyone to Christ. I'm too unstable. My life is not all together right now. And then, of course, I realized, you know, God is using me in my weakness. He's using me in a time when I don't have it all together, mm -hmm. which was amazing because, you know, I've often asked God, you know, what am I doing here in New York City? And why am I not on the mission field in Africa, you know, where I'd be leading patients to Christ every day and you know, here in New York, I, maybe one or two other patients I've seen that have come to Christ. And here you bring this Jewish woman to Christ in the year of my greatest weakness. It's amazing, you know, it's really true that, that God can use us despite our weakness. Yeah, his strength is made perfect in weakness. So I came to grips with that and realized that this was not about me, and this was not about my expertise in winning someone to Christ. But in fact, God was doing something here, and he was blessing me through it. So my father actually had introduced me to uh, Pastor Abraham Sandler, who works with the Christian Missionary Alliance in establishing Messianic Jewish Church in Philadelphia and New York. So he has a, a church here in New York, and I, I'd never actually met him personally, but it was a wonderful connection that my dad had made, especially since he had just died this year. 
So I emailed him, and I told him what was going on. He said, well, let's meet together. So Abe and Iris and I met on a Tuesday morning before my office hours at Mount Sinai Hospital in the cafe, and we explained the gospel to her very clearly, and she prayed to accept Christ. Wow. And it was amazing. That probably doesn't happen too often in the cafe there, does it? (laughs) (laughs) No, I don't think so. That's great. God does his work wherever he wants to do it. What was her reaction? What I mean, what happened in her life after that momentous decision? Well, you sort of never know if someone's going to, you know, grab hold of it and, and really run with it or kind of be mediocre. She was the former. She latched on to Pastor Abe and joined his Jewish Christian congregation in uh, lower Manhattan. And uh, she's gone there every Friday ever since. Wow. Developed an incredible bond with the people there. Uh, I was able to attend her baptism on January 10th of this year at that congregation. And at the same time, near where she lives in Elmhurst, Queens, she's been going to the New Life Fellowship uh, Church Bible study on Tuesdays and has developed some wonderful relationships there. And and she's just really, she just learns so much, and, and she sends me occasional emails and texts to tell me about, you know, what latest scripture they're studying and maybe what question she has for me. But um, it's, it's been wonderful to see her grow. What impacts this had on you? I mean, uh, I mean, you kind of touched on that as you were thinking about uh, helping her take this step. But, I mean, as you sit here and process it, what do you think the lessons that you've learned that are applicable to other physicians and healthcare professionals listening to this? Well, certainly that... God can use us wherever we are, and He can use us no matter whether we're in a state of strength or weakness. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really not about having the strategy down and knowing just what to say, and uh, I think it's really simply, in this case, just a willingness, willingness to dialogue uh, with the patient, to be open to... You know, to break the ice, I think at the very beginning, just uh, offering a prayer for her uh, gave her a signal that, you know, that was part of who I was. Mm-hmm. And so that was a, an open door for her to ask about and something which if she kept coming back to me, she would probably hear about that again. Yeah. And I think the other thing I see in it is just that, you know, evangelism is a process. I mean, you know, this was what, three or four years before she came to that uh, decision. And, you know, God's spirit was working and it was just one step at a time. And, and you were just so faithful to to be thinking, what's the next step? Where What do I need to do next? Whether it's give her a Bible that she could understand to recommending a Bible study and you didn't prematurely try any of those things. You, God just kind of gave you direction on when the right time was for the next step as she Move down that road. Has she been able to impact other lives in her family or daughter or anyone like that? Or has she talk mm. about that? So this is another amazing part of the story, is that 40 years ago, uh, her brother became a Christian and was excommunicated from the family. Mm. She visited her brother a couple of years after that. And when she came home, her mother said, how dare you ever speak to him uh, again? And she never did after that. She told me about this, and I said, well, why don't you try to find your brother and see if he's alive and tell him what's happened. And So she tried to look him up. He wasn't where he used to live in New Jersey. In fact, uh, she eventually found him on the Internet, and he lives in Philadelphia. Uh, Eventually they got in touch, and she actually went down to visit him over Christmas this last year, and it was an absolutely joyous reunion. Hmm. And him and his wife and their whole Christian community there have completely embraced Iris. And uh, it's it's just been phenomenal to see this reunion. Uh, the, the, they're the only living siblings of their family. And so to come together again like that under these circumstances and to be able to share Christ with each other is just unbelievable. I wonder how many years he was praying for her, probably all 40 of them. <laughs> Right. You know, and and we often think, you know, God just put us in the equation and he's got all these other things going on that, uh, you know, we may never find out or sometimes do. You know, uh, Iris did uh, recently uh, have a recurrence in her mouth of cancer. And that was 
very, very hard for her to deal with. And at first, she, you know, was in denial, and she didn't, she didn't want to deal with it. She didn't, she couldn't believe this was happening. She didn't want any treatment. But as the days went by and we communicated, she realized that she should engage with the system and with me and with the treatment. And we just operated on her last week um, because it was a solitary recurrence in the mouth, and it looks like we're able to cure it. But this has been another opportunity for her to see the community of faith come around her and support her. And I, I honestly have to tell you, in my years of surgery, I've never seen a patient so supported, prayed for, and loved as this. Wow. Randy, I want to thank you for taking time out of a busy day. I know you've been operating to tell us a story. You've, you've enthused us and challenged us and got us excited about sharing our faith through our practice. Just thank you for your faithfulness. Oh, you're very welcome. It's uh, been my pleasure. Uh, it's been great to listen to Christian Doctors Digest over the last several years and be inspired by the stories. And I'm just happy to contribute this story of what God has done. Wow, what a journey of faith Randy shared with us with this patient. You know, as we think about that personally, you may be thinking, oh man, I don't know if I could ever do that. And a Jewish atheist, oh my goodness, she might say something I wouldn't know how to handle. Uh, You know, God wants you to exercise your faith. He wants you to have your practice be a ministry, not just in taking care of patients as Christ would in, in healthcare, but really raising faith flags, telling faith stories, pointing people to Christ, realizing that's a process that you can be part of. God may not give you the opportunity, as he did Randy, to lead a patient to Christ, but he is going to give you opportunities every day to share your faith. Hey, listen, we've got a whole brand new curriculum hot off the press that can help you be the witness God's designed you to be. It's called Grace Prescriptions. If you were around about 15 years ago, you know about the saline solution. Well, this is the newer, better version, expanded with a lot of new information. And you need a refresher course if you took the saline solution, or if you never took it, you need to. It will transform your practice. Now, there's two ways to go about it. We've got some conferences planned where you can go. And the great thing about that is it's some focused time to really get into this. And both Walt Laramore and Bill Pill will be presenting at that one. Uh, Also, you can just go to the CMDA website, and uh, you'll see there on the front page information about Grace Prescription video series. If you go to the conference, you can buy the series, come back, train your colleagues, train people in your community, have this as a wonderful outreach to other Christian physicians in your area and other healthcare professionals, including pastors. Or you can just use this for your own study. What a great opportunity to sharpen your skills. You know, we do so much about, well, we got to keep up and get our CME. We got to be better at what we're doing. And that's true. But more important to Christ than how up to date you are in healthcare is whether you've turned your practice into a ministry and whether you're doing that every day. And we have the information that will help you learn it. And a lot of other resources as well, besides the video series, uh, including the Faith Factor, Proof of Healing, and the Power of Prayer, and lots of other things that you'll find in the CMDA bookstore. Check it out. Go to cmda.org. Get a copy of the video series. There's some books that will help you today. So Bill and I, Bill and I have been doing grace prescriptions for 10 hours now. You do the whole thing in 10 minutes. You explain everything. Um, what's happened since? What's the rest of the, the story? Well, um, she, Iris died su- subsequently. She developed a recurrence, and, um, and that, that was very, very difficult for her to handle. I think her... Her faith was very intense, but it was also very young. And so um, it was really difficult. You know, she didn't understand why would God healed me. You know, why is it possible that he would allow this to come back? And, and, and actually, it was, it was complex. It was difficult to deal with because I tried to explain to her, you know, some fairly advanced 
concepts about uh, suffering and sovereignty and we don't know how God is using this and so on. And, and there were difficulties too because there were um, complications with her family. You know, her, her daughter didn't like the fact that she became a Christian um, and um, was, was resistant to you know, her going to the, the Messianic uh, Jewish congregation. And so there were a lot of dynamics there that were, were tricky, and I wasn't quite sure how to navigate all of them. I did the best I could, and Abe Sandler was awesome throughout the whole thing. Um, and even at the end, it was, it was very hard because I got a call from the emergency room that she was intubated and had, um, you know, uh, a very poor prognosis. And that her daughter was there and um, that she did not want me to come. So it was difficult because I had had this relationship with the patient, but then once she became incapacitated and the daughter was making decisions, um, she prevented me from, from making contact. And um, Abe uh, compassionately comforted me that, well, we know where she's going. And we know that we'll see her there. Um, and so I had to rest in that. So, and, and I continued to pray for her daughter and her daughter's mm-hmm. husband. And, um, y- you know, one, one kind of humorous uh, relief is that her daughter met her husband on ChristianMingle.com. <laughs> <laughs> so God said, God said, or. Yeah, so you just never know, right? The way the way God will direct this whole thing. But um, continue to pray for them. So. Sometimes, uh, in our health as health professionals, it's scary to do something a first time, a spinal tap or whatever. And and then as we do it more, it, it seems to become we, we gain the fruit of of being able to do that. How's the fruitfulness of this particular uh, patient affected your practice? We've not talked about how what's happened since has it changed anything or well it's it's interesting i i i would say um it definitely has been part of my faith journey to uh deepen my experience and my relationship with god and my trust in him um i think other people have heard about the story and been impacted by it some of the people in the messianic jewish congregation were really um, impacted by Iris, and that was awesome to see. Um, but you know, interestingly, I've been sharing with my group a little bit. I think over the last six months, I've I've maybe been somewhat um, lazy in my practice. You know, and it's actually interesting that I haven't really had any big cancer cases in the last I don't know six months or so. It's just been all thyroids and parathyroids and quick and easy, and you know. Patients are not that, you know, distraught and haven't had an iris in a long time. Um, and, um, and I was actually wondering, maybe I should pray for that. Hmm. You know, maybe I should pray that God would bring patients to me that uh, are an opportunity to, to go deeper. But I think the other thing is that I do need to be conscious of this kind of laziness, you know, all of these patients don't really need to talk about it. It's not that big a deal. They're just getting a hemithyroidectomy, you know. So I'll just tell them, you know, I, I'm a Christian and I pray for you. Sign here. I have to see the next patient, you know. <laughs> Instead of mm-hmm. taking a little more time and, and, and planning that into my day that yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make time for patients. You never know. They may be distraught and hiding something that's not as obvious as a patient that Iris might have. So. so that may be a divine appointment even if they don't have cancer. Yeah. So God did send Jesus to save thyroid and parathyroid patients too. Not exactly. just, <laughs> I'm just checking out. I'm not a surgeon, so I don't know these things. Yeah. I, I'm ignorant. And, and, you're uh, right. But, but <laughs> it's hard to, to share. Um, because we're so used to, as healthcare professionals, you know, we're healthcare professionals. This is a tough interview because it was a difficult year for you mm-hmm. personally and in many ways. Was it hard to open up like that? 
Yeah, I guess, you know, I had the chance to prepare for it, but, uh, and, and, you know, a little easier on the phone instead of in front of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, um, you know, God has shown me in so many ways his provision for me. So. Well, thank you for sharing. And it is a story that's a blessing people who hear it around the country. It's a privilege for Bill and I to meet you. And well. we look forward to seeing Iris with you one day in the future. Amen. So thank you, Randy. We have uh, time for just a, a few questions. I did want to give uh, opportunities, so we'll start in the back. And just, it's interesting, Iris. Do you want to talk to Randy? Or? Yeah, I, I just oh, yeah, okay, let's do that. Uh, thank you, Iris, or uh, thank you, uh, Randy, for your, for your show. But I, I just want to comment that Iris means rainbow. Um, so, does it? Uh, yes, it does. So wow. I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you, Randy, for sharing that. And um, it reminded me of something I've been thinking about in the recent weeks is that in the Bible, a lot of times it talks about salvation came to you and your household or it came to like Lydia and her household. And normally I always think of, quote, evangelism as a one-to-one -one target as opposed to how do I pray for God to be moving in the hearts of the entire family, for the entire family to long for God and to seek after God and to, and to be able to understand the truth of the gospel. And, and so I just wanted to kind of mention that, that our impact isn't just directly the person who's in front of us, but also their family members, um, whether it's them directly sharing their faith with their family members or how they cope and their different dynamics of the stressors of illness. It, the entire family is suffering. It's not just the patient that's suffering. So. That's a great point. And it's our opportunity to share, to shine, is much greater than just the person that we're talking to. It's the people that they talk to, their family members, sometimes our staff and colleagues. And taking that bushel basket off allows that light to shine in all directions, allows the salt of our conversation to go in all directions. It's a good thing. You know, there's a, uh, the, the word household in Greek is the word oikos, like the Greek yogurt. And uh, it actually, uh, it, it means a whole lot more than family, although a lot of times it, it's translated as family. The, whole, the household was basically the place of business. So it was all these networks of relationships not only the, the immediate family, but the extended family, people that work there in that household, and customers that came into it. So it, it, once one person coming to Christ does affect a lot of other people, uh, as you said. So it's good. What other comments, questions do you have? I was wondering if you could elaborate on a particular situation. As an OBGYN, oftentimes I'm on call, and I get mothers that come in that I don't know um, that may have maybe in the emergency room with a miscarriage, or maybe coming to you know our particular hospital because they haven't felt the baby move in the third trimester, and subsequently are diagnosed with a fetal demise. Now you talk about how important it is to take a spiritual history, but I have absolutely no history with this patient and have to give them one of the most devastating you know, things that they might ever go through with. And clearly that's an opportunity because they are devastated and at the worst you know, possible time. Um, you don't necessarily want to refer them out with something like that because they could remain angry at God for a long mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. because of that. What, do you have any insight or suggestions mm -hmm. um, yeah. with a patient that you don't know? Yeah. Um, I think the spiritual assessment is critically important. Randy gave a real good example. I mean, just in a couple of questions as part of his first evaluation with a patient that was obviously with severe advanced disease, but was able to give both a sense of where she was and reflect to her a sense of who he was. So to, in, in his particular case, say, well, I just want you to know that I pray with, even though you've had this difficult situation, you've turned on God. But I pray for my patients. Is that something you would want? And she and her daughter said, they didn't say no. But it was with that prayer that you saw the first little glimmer. But even in his situation, I mean, that patient came in knowing that there was something 
Sure. But, but this patient the, didn't know any, any But patient. the spiritual assessment can be done at, in any patient. And the more critical or the more devastating or the more severe the situation, the more appropriate that particular history is. Now, if I was seeing somebody who had already had, say, most of their history taken by, say, an ER doc or the nursing staff, but say, for example, uh, I was a surgeon, I was going to operate on somebody, I would want to know if they were a smoker or not. And so if I noticed that one in the history, I'd say, hey, I noticed that nobody asked you about, and this is a factor that's going to be important for me. By the way, spiritually, I noticed no one asked you about, this is going to be a factor that's important for me as I care for you. Maybe an option for finding out where they're at so that you can join them there. Does that make sense? But rather than me giving you some sort of pat answer, it's to begin to ask God, wow, I've never thought of this before. How do I deal with this in my practice, with my personality, with my temperament? What of these spiritual interventions would be possible that I can begin to think about and begin to practice and to do that with an accountability partner, whether it's a partner or a friend that you can share these experiences with, perhaps it's someone you practice with or, or someone who trains you, or, but to begin to step out in faith in the power of the Holy Spirit, leaving the results to God, realizing this is a divine appointment. Oh, Father, what do I do? And Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will give you the words when you get there. Isn't that what Paul told us? So, not to give a pat answer, but to say this is, these are great questions that each of you are thinking. Gosh, Father, how do I apply this into my life? Well, can I just validate what you just said? Because I'm a liver pancreas surgeon. Uh, so patients that I see for my sp subspecialty care is cancer patients for the most part. And I'm a surgeon. I have to operate. You know, I usually I go see the patient, especially in the hospital. We're talking about surgery in the next 24 or 48 hours. I'm there to actually not only inform the patient of the diagnosis and their prognosis, but now I need to get them to sign a consent if they're operative candidate. So we're dealing with the same kind of short very time intense, time crunch. They're getting the, the worst news of their life right now. And they need to make a big decision right now. And just as you said, I, I do a very quick assessment. I mean, what's your faith background? Um, just to see if they open up. And I go straight to pray. Say, listen, I pray for my patients, especially those that have cancer. Can I pray for you? And I've not had a single patient say no. And then the other part um, that I found useful is I've met a, a minister who actually his ministry is dedicated to uh, serving cancer patients, terminally ill patients. Uh, it's, uh, Jim Henry is his name, uh, and it's called the Life Givers Network. And some of you know uh, Jim and his group uh, in this room. And that's what he does. That was God's calling for him uh, based out of his family experience with cancer and all the patients that he's met. And so I can then refer that patient. Can, look, I have a, a friend who's also a minister who works with cancer patients, and he ministers to them. It would be okay if he comes and visits you tomorrow in your room. And they will say yes. And I give Jim a call, and Jim comes and talks with them. He does more in-depth, you know, assessment of what's going on, what kind of struggles that they've had, where they are at, and if they're ready for prayer or share the gospel. You know, I, I trust Jim now because I've shared many patients with him, and I know where his heart has had. But this is this goes to the idea of the spiritual care team that we talked about earlier. That's good. you got to develop someone who can come along to your patients. Could it be hard for you to do? Good. Thank you, man. All right. Well, well, Randy, thanks again for sharing that. Um, you know, God gave Randy a, a beautiful, in some ways, and, and shared with you this time lapse, you know, where he was able to take Iris through all of these steps. And I think that happens in some ways very rarely uh, with people in healthcare, uh, because sometimes you may just see people just this one window uh, of time. But again, all you're trying to do is help them take one step, whatever that next step is. And uh, it's great if you help them take more than that.
because there, there is, once they take that step, there is a next step. But God may use somebody else to help them take that next step. And we, we want to, we're, we're one link in the chain, uh, so let's make sure we're not the missing link, okay? Uh, not the missing link. Well, we're going to talk about prayer next and uh, how that actually fits in the story. Let me just tell you a quick story before we jump into our, uh, our case here. Uh, Kathy and I have some friends in Dallas. We see at least every year at Christmas cocktail parties, uh, you know, as, as they come up and we're about to, we will see them again this year. Uh, I'm going to use the names uh, Jim and Cindy. Uh, that's not their real names, but uh, we first met them, I guess, probably 12 years ago, 13 years ago at a Christmas party. And while we were singing Christmas carols, uh, Jim and Cindy were over in the corner with some of their friends just kind of snickering at us, very cynical type people, very sophisticated type people. And uh, so this happened almost every year, uh, this, would, this would happen. And uh, about, um, I guess, six or seven years ago, uh, Jim got prostate cancer. He ended up down at, uh, uh, at uh, MD Anderson Hospital. And uh, the surgeon came out to have his pre-op visit. And uh, as, as Cindy told the story, he began to walk away and turned around and came back and said, would you like for me to pray for you before we go into surgery? And so here are these cynical people who had no respect for Christianity, no respect for the gospel. Guess what, guess what he said? Guess what they said? Yes. What's really interesting is they're t <laughs> Cindy is telling Kathy this story over lunch with a mutual friend and uh, about what, the, what that actually meant to her. This, this, when people are in critical places, it, they, they want this. Uh, for the most part, and so we should take the opportunity to, to ask them the question, would you like for me to pray for you? So let's take a look at the case that's uh, in your workbook here on page 71 here. So let's read the case aloud in your groups and then uh, discuss this. Do you think it's appropriate for healthcare professionals to pray for or with their patients? And do you pray with your patients? Okay. So how about, how about you? Do you pray for and with your patients? We, we hope that, uh, that you're praying for your patients. That's crucial. We hope that also that you come to the place where you become comfortable praying with your patients when that is appropriate, when it is done with permission, and when it is done with respect and sensitivity. But why is this so important? Uh, we've talked about this uh, uh, yesterday, but uh, we meet people that are like Doubting Thomas here. It says, my life is good. If I become a Christian, well, there are things I just don't want to give up. We're dealing with people in the volitional barrier. Do you remember what this is really all about here? Uh, we're, helping a pe we're helping people move from beginning to trust us and trust. They begin to trust the Bible just a little bit, and we want them to ultimately trust Christ. So this is the volitional barrier. And remember, it's a predisposition to resist uh, the gospel altogether. And it's really about a bad nature. And that's what we're up against here. People are dead spiritually. So this is a time for apologetics, appeals, but especially prayer. And our goal is that people will trust Christ. And I would probably say this is true. Almost nobody comes to Christ uh, without prayer in some way. Um, and uh, we need to begin to recognize this is the one tool that we have that no one can, they cannot forbid this. Uh, <laughs> no one can forbid us praying for our patients. Why is this really important? Uh, this session, we're going to talk about the case for uh, prayer, both, uh, both biblically and clinically, but so it's my job to talk about this biblically. So let's take a look at these different things, several different things I want to say about this, and then we're going to go to break here. Did you realize that the first time God calls on man to pray, 
It is for physical healing. That's, this is an amazing thing. First time God asked, asked someone to pray, it is for their physical healing. This is when, you remember, uh, Abraham lent his wife to Abimelech, him not knowing she was his wife, and he took her into his, uh, his harem, got very sick. And God says to Abimelech, he, he go to Abraham and ask him to pray for you, and then maybe I'll heal you. That's the first time prayer is mentioned in regard to healing. Isn't that interesting? That's, that's fascinating to me. Uh, we also pray because God prescribes prayer for Christians. Um, uh, in 1 Thessalonians, it says, be joyful always. Pray how much? Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. By the way, just, just a little tidbit for you uh, highly intelligent people here, if you want to show somebody that you're really intelligent, the word pray, the, the passage pray without ceasing, that's actually the shortest verse in the Bible. You just thought it was Jesus wept, but in the Greek Bible, it's really pray without ceasing. So do you know the shortest verse in the Bible? It's not Jesus wept, it's pray without ceasing. So if that's, you know, if you need to use that sometime to show off, you can. Just, <laughs> just, just for your sake. But God prescribes prayer for Christians. He also um, prescribes prayer for the sick. James 5, 14 and 15 says, If anyone's sick, he should call the elders of the church to pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick man well, and the Lord will raise him up. Um, let, let me look at this passage over in your margin here by John Calvin. He says, Our prayer must not be self-centered. It must arise not only because we feel our own need as a burden we must lay upon God, but also because we are bound up in love of our fellow man, that we feel their need as acutely as our own. That's why we pray for people, because we feel their need just as much as, as we feel our own needs. So God prescribes prayer for the sick for us to be praying for and caring for people. He also prescribes prayer in time of need. Hebrews 4 says, when Jesus landed, or excuse me, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive grace and mercy in time of need. He also, uh, we also pray because God cares about the physical world and human bodies. Uh, this is so important to understand. Uh, the physical and the spiritual to God are all one thing. He does not see these as separate departments. And we see this all through this, the scripture. Is Jesus concerned about physical bodies? Absolutely. Matthew 14, when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Third John chapter, verse 2 says, I pray that you may enjoy health and that it may go well with you even as your soul is getting well, uh, getting along well. God cares about our health, and to pray for that is something that touches his heart well. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God cares about the physical world and human bodies because we also pray because God hears us. Uh, 1 John 5 says, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask for. God promises to hear us. Uh, he promises that. And then uh, we also pray because ultimate healing comes from a relationship with Christ. John 6 is very clear. It says, no man can come to the Father unless or Lois can come to me unless the Father draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Isaiah 53 is a passage I think most of you know, at connecting uh, physical healing with what Christ has done for us. Surely he took our infirmities, he carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Uh, God connects these things. Ultimate healing only comes through Jesus Christ. And uh, whatever healing we experience in our, on earth and in the future will be because of the death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. But look at this passage. This is one of my favorites in all the Bible here. Uh, it's Revelation 21. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. He will wipe 
every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. In your margin, there's this, the, the, we've included this entire verse. And look at the last few words. Is that he who was sitting on the throne said, I am making everything new. I'm making everything new. And this, he's not saying that he's creating something brand new. That, there are two words for, for, for new in, uh, in the Bible. One means brand new. One means really made fresh, restored. And that's the word that hits here, here. God is going to restore us in incredible ways to make us fresh as a newborn baby uh, when we come into a relationship uh, with him and see him face to face. That's why we pray, ladies and gentlemen. God cares about all this. Don't ever make that mistake. Uh, God, cares about people's, uh, God cares about people's souls, but he also cares about their bodies. And that's why prayer for physical healing is always, always appropriate. It's something that we should engage in at every time, every time the Spirit nudges us, uh, whether it's publicly with a patient or privately on our own for them. It's incredibly important. So that's what the Bible says about prayer. I bet you didn't really need all of, the, all of that to, to understand how important prayer is. Uh, but what about the clinical part of that? Is, it really, is there some justification for, for prayer uh, clinically that you need to know about as healthcare professionals? Uh, and the fact is, there certainly is. But we're going to tell you about that after break, okay? Okay.